Okay, so I guess it's a good time to kick off the event and as people come in, we can accommodate them. Um, so hello everybody, thank you for joining us from all parts of the world. My name is Shubhangini and I am a fifth year, uh, soon to be fifth year, currently fourth year PhD student at the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. And it is my absolute pleasure to have with us Paris Arora, who's also um, a student of anthropology, uh, a PhD, a PhD student um, at the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University, who will be sharing their thoughts with us today. And I will, of course, be telling you all more about their work, the amazing work they've been doing, and uh, what they will be telling us about today. But just before I do that, um, just a quick moment to tell you about what is it that we, uh, what forum um, is uh, enabling us to host this event, and what are the kinds of work that we do, and then. Uh, to introduce our speaker for the day. So um, this event is hosted as a part of the events of the Stanford South Asia Working Group, um, which has been very kindly sponsored and um, supported by the Stanford so Center for South Asia. Uh, the forum was set up in 2021 uh, by myself and my colleague Shantanu Nevrekar as a space to enable um, students, uh, early career scholars, postdocs to be able to share their academic journey, uh, which could be in the form of their ongoing work, ideas, as well as situations and just understanding um, the world around them, which affects their academic and their professional lives. Um, and it again, was intended to be a space for community building and for networking so that people from around the world, students from around the world are able to um, exchange ideas and really understand what everyone is uh, really up to. And uh, we host a, a bunch of activities. We, able, we um, are able to do this um, by paper presentations, um, speaker sessions, group discussions, uh, movie discussions and any other formats that might help the different participants um, and speakers who, who wish to be a part of the event. Um, so without much ado, um, I will introduce our speaker for today, my co-coordinator and lovely colleague, uh, who also happens to be a fantastic anthropologist, uh, Paris Arora. Uh, Paris is a second year PhD student at the Department of Anthropology, Stanford University. Uh, as a socio-cultural, medical and psychological anthropologist, Paris is currently studying how families of autistic individuals grapple with the aging and continued dependency of autistic adults in the absence of state-mandated social support in India. The project seeks to theorize autism um, as a shared condition care as an experiment in ethics, and family as a capacious and contested mode of collective being in India. Their research has been supported by many organizations, including the King Center on Global Development, the Society for Psychological Anthropology, Robert Levelson Foundation, Hans Wildorf Foundation, and the Foundation for the Study of International Relations in Switzerland. And today they will be sharing with us a very um, important and honestly very interesting part of their research. I'll of course let them speak more about that and really tell what they've been up to. But it does speak about innovative methodologies in the field of anthropology and how um, they can further sensitive research or nuance um, different topics such as the research that they, they're engaged in in the field of anthropology. So with that, the floor is to you, Paris, please. Thank you so much, Shubhankini, for that really kind introduction and for being an extraordinary co-coordinator alongside me for this really little old thing that we do here in association with the Center for South Asia at Stanford. Uh, it is the last event of the South Asia Working Group here during this academic year, and I'm really honored to be invited to present some of my reminiscence. Um, it's something that I have never really presented. Uh, it's not really even like a, a traditional academic paper, and that's precisely what I'm trying to do here, is to really experiment with the genre of ethnographic practice and production. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen, and then I'm going to talk about... Um, how this session is going to go. Um, and I look forward to hearing from um, uh, everyone. And I really want to thank uh, the wide range of scholars, practitioners, and interested audience members who have joined us today. 
Um, I know that we are from different time zones, so it is uh, not the most opportune for a lot of you, but I really, really appreciate, uh, Bocha Bangani and I appreciate you joining us for this event. Um, for accessibility purposes, I will be adding a link, a Google Drive link to the talk that I will be reading out today. I will also make sure to read at a slow pace. I have written it in an in what seems to me to be a relatively lucid manner. Uh, there's very little theory, jargon, and uh, academic references in my work for now, because it's a talk and I want it to be as accessible as possible. Um, and for those who will be reading alongside uh, through the access copy instead of looking at the screen uh, and the presentation that I will have, don't be worried. The images that I have on the presentation, I have also embedded it within the access copy. So pick your um, preference. Uh, I was about to say poison, but I mean, <laughs> whatever you would like, whatever genre of engagement you would like to engage with. So I'm going to share the Google Drive link now and maybe Shubhangini, you can reshare it in some while so that the new participants can also have access to it. My only request is that please don't download it or use those images or texts without, uh, you know, um, permissions because it's still very much in formulation and this is just for this particular event. Okay. Uh, I hope the link works. Um, I'll begin sharing with my slide. Uh, Okay, so people can see the slideshow, right? I'm going to uh, make it a slideshow now. Excellent. So it's clearly uh, legible and it's readable, I'm assuming, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we go. Um, the I, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt. Just one thing I wanted to tell the audience members in case they have questions that they'd like to address as the talk is going on. As you may have noticed, the security settings for the meeting are set on such that you won't be able to unmute yourself or be able to put things on the chat. It's just because we are dealing with a large number of participants for this particular session. Uh, after the talk, we have... A dedicated section for Q&A after uh, for which the chat section will be open. So I am really sorry I forgot to mention this in the first part, but I thought it might be prudent for our joining participants. So in case you have questions, please note them down and there will be the chat box will be open for all of them as soon as we finish with the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was really important. Uh, generally, our sessions are, are not as uh, <laughs> widely attended so we had to update our security settings just to make sure that the talk goes uh, by rather quickly okay so the title of the paper or this rather uh, reflection is an invitation to ethnographic drawing improvisation immersion and impression i will begin by reading the abstract uh, and then i will talk about uh, what is it that i'm trying to do in this paper so a desire to render an accurate and attentive picture of our shared world with our interlocutors continues to captivate the anthropological imaginary. And I would say even for other disciplines who are interested in building uh, knowledge through empirical fieldwork. This desire along with an ethical impulse to restore the humanity of our interlocutors has taken the form of experiments with the very genre of ethnographic practice and production. Amongst these experiments, drawing during fieldwork has re-emerged as an important research method over the last decade from being represented as a clear departure from anthropology's insistence on reading cultures as texts, which is now our dated kind of insistence. We don't do that anymore, but there is still a lot of insistence on discourses, meaning making and language. Uh, whereas there has been a rather fear of the visual as some anthropologists have pointed out. To being rediscovered is a crucial method in the anthropological toolbox since anthropology's colonial inception. So there's also revisionist work which suggests that a lot of um, colonial officers who were anthropologists in some places uh, use drawing as a mapping exercise. So it is a tool that has been used for colonial projects as well. Drawing is being morally reoriented as an enticing multimodal method for the future. Um, In this talk, I wish to uh, ask, what kind of an invitation is one to draw? I explore several possible answers to this question by reflecting on my long-standing relationship with drawing as an expressive genre in my field, which is also my home. 
While tracing the rise of familial and institutional experiments in caring for autistic adults in Delhi, India, for my research, I have intimately encountered the limits of ethnography as a face-to-face -face encounter, verbal practice, and written product. Started as a way of caring for my own autistic sibling, drawing quickly seeped into my ethnographic re recollections, relationships, and representations. By ethnopoetically attending to this visual seepage between familial and field relationships, I extend an invitation to not only draw, but also to redraw the contours of the ethnographic method. And I will be exploring three possible answers to this question, which is what might it mean for an ethnographer to accept an invitation to draw during the varied stages of fieldwork? And that's what my insistence is, that we are not just talking about the literature that has reoriented uh, uh, multimodality or drawing as an important method. Uh, it doesn't only suggest drawing in the field. It requires drawing of different kinds at different levels of fieldwork. And all of those different genres of engaging with the world through uh, drawing um, leads to different kinds of ethnographic sensibilities. And that's the larger question that I want to uh, you know, think about maybe even beyond this talk, how might drawing amongst a variety of other multimodal methods engender a mode of doing ethnography that is more collaborative, intersubjective and imaginative? So with that, the first um, response to the question, what does it mean to accept an invitation to draw, is that drawing is an invitation to improvise. And here I will begin the talk with some, a lot of autoethnography, but I hope that that shows um, uh, certain, uh, you know, certain um, patterns uh, in your own work and in your own kind of commitments to ethnography. Get ready, an invitation has come for you. A week prior to the World Autism Awareness Day in 2012, my high school art teacher, Miss Vinnie, had summoned me to her office with these words. Dotted with heavily detailed imitations of Indian folk art traditions, her office was right behind the art room, which was a dimly lit refuge for many creative students like me. Our creativity as students, however, indexed much more than our artistic skill. Since we were more likely to be bullied by our classmates for, our for the rhythm of our gait or the pitch of our voice, we strategically, or rather creatively, spend the proverbial zero period every day in the art room. Before the first period began every day, as per the instructions of Miss Vinnie, we would carefully recreate highly ornate and popular Indian folk art motifs, ranging from Kalamkari peacocks, as you see on your screen, to Madhubani fishes. After looking at laminated printouts of exceptionally detailed artworks, our hands were supposed to mimic the dainty flow with which a peacock turned away from the onlooker without losing sight of how big the piece of cartridge paper in front of us was. Between looking closely at the original motif, measuring the space we had available, committing to the first stroke, erasing it, committing again, looking again at the motif, and then looking at the ceiling for some kind of a break, or copying, as Miss Vinnie's critics put, put it, we were learning to see and be present differently. While conceptualizing drawing as a practice of ethnographic description, Jasmin Kashanipur introduces the concept of the gradual gaze. For Kashanipur, drawing's inherently mimetic impulse merges with the mobility of the subject drawn to produce a distinct form of gradual seeing, whereby unlearning and learning congeal. I promise that's the hardest sentence that I have written in this talk. What that means is that we tend to unlearn as we must free the subject of our drawing from language to roughly sketch out its contours. But as we shift our gaze between the thing being drawn and the drawn thing, we begin to learn something new about how that subject comes into being in relationship to what John Berger calls the environment and the people. This shift from looking at being to seeing becoming is what Jean Berger refers to what refers to when he describes the process of drawing the face of his father after he passed away. When Berger drew his dead father's face, he could feel the history and experience which made his father's eyelids the way they were. By asking us to redraw a relatively lifeless drawing of a peacock, by intensely looking at it, 
Miss Winnie was making us so intensely present between those two sheets of paper that we became momentarily absent from school. We were accompanying the coming into being of that peacock with its distinct history and location into a newer peacock for our school's display boards. We had to imagine where that peacock came from, why it was drawn the way it was, and where it was going. And to do that, we were escaping the immediate by intensely seeing it. Maybe as one of the only unmarried middle-aged women in our school, Ms. Vinny knew how much her creative or queer students needed to embody this different kind of gaze and presence in order to survive that school. One day, Ms. Vinny interrupted this mimetic magic with an invitation for me. One of the poshest schools in Delhi was organizing a poster making event along with an interactive workshop on autism. High school students from all over Delhi were going to be there and she wanted me to represent our school. This is all true by the way. She assured me that her decision had everything to do with the fact that my brother was autistic. Even though I had never mentioned anything about Nippon, my brother, to Miss Vinny, I had an inkling that my mother must have smuggled an information about him during a parent-teacher meeting or a PTM as we call it in India. Worried about not being caring enough as a mother, my mother must have asked Miss Vinnie to give me special attention to the special sibling of a special child. Whatever it was, I was now invited to draw not only alongside autism, but on it. It was an odd topic for a poster. In our school, we only drew posters about saving Mother Earth, our planet, or preserving Indian heritage, especially because that was the time when the Commonwealth Games were being organized in Delhi. And uh, we were all being asked to draw these posters on these themes. And here comes an invitation to draw something on autism. But where, uh, yeah, in our school, we only drew posters about saving our planet or preserving Indian heritage. Maybe that other posh school had autistic uh, students and not just their siblings. Where was I supposed to look for autism? It seemed to be everywhere. According to my doctor uncle, uh, my mama, my mother's brother, autism was supposed to be inside my brother's brain. But Nippon experienced no pain in his head though he would cover his ears, but only when our relatives would come over unannounced because it was a break in the domestic routine. According to my mother, however, autism happened when my grandmother did not take care of her during pregnancy. The contentiously universal symbol for autism advocacy has been a jigsaw puzzle for many years. After looking that up on Google Images a day or two before the poster making event, I pieced together a drawing of what the shared condition called autism looked like to my family. A feeling of being inflamed by one's fate, a feeling of being encumbered by one's relations, a feeling of being gossiped about, and a feeling of flying and then being cut short. For Jean Berger, to draw is to assemble together multiple moments of looking at something in the face of its disappearance. In a similar stroke, Michael Tosik argues that drawing allows us to desperately testify to what might have flashed right before our eyes in an effort to mediate or control our reality. By piecing the unfinished puzzle of autism together, using whatever was available to a teenager's eyes then, a young Paris was not only recording, but improvising when invited to draw. In piecing together an image for an intended audience, a young Paris had to negotiate both Hutodian and extreme representations of autism within which he and his interlocutors, which was his family at that time, was embedded. Moreover, in this visual negotiation or curation, he foregrounded a young boy's attempt to reach out to the mother-child duo before they disappeared into the flames of the social. Scenes of improvising, therefore, are scenes of desiring and invoking a certain kind of world into being. Drawings are collages of our desires. And the R here includes the ethnographer and interlocutor. Let me turn to a more recent vignette that might highlight this function of drawing even further. I received another invitation to draw just last summer when I was conducting preliminary ethnographic fieldwork in Delhi, India. I was trying to establish contacts with parent activists who were at the forefront of reimagining the future of their autistic adult children 
by cultivating caring communities beyond kinship ties. So in India, there is very minimal state mandated social support that it's almost absent, especially for cognitively disabled adults, uh, of which the biggest population is of those on the autism spectrum. And because of that, a lot of parents have actually started their own residential care institutions, uh, which are often called assisted living centers or hostels. And my ethnographic research is about those centers. And I was doing preliminary research to find appropriate centers where I could do long-term research. So I'm still very much at the pre preliminary stage of my fieldwork. In this attempt to find these institutions, I ended up at an assisted living institution that claimed to provide day-to-day -day care to autistic adults and respite to their families. The institution specialized in providing, the, the one that I'm talking about right now, provided emotional management training to its residents by instilling an attunement to personalized routines in each and every one of, uh, in each and every one who came to their facility. In material terms, this meant that every resident had a personal binder with a daily schedule that started with waking up and ended with brushing one's teeth at night. Each daily activity was accompanied by a drawing of what the activity looked like. As each activity was undertaken, the resident could take the image of what was done and put it in the done pocket of the binder. Devised as a cheap and effective way to avoid the violent outbursts of some residents over others, this strategy was popularized by this assisted living facility, especially in a context where sedatives are routinely used to manage the autistic adult's emotional overreactions. These are all terms that were used in the field. I don't use that. Um, and this is basically to suggest that these kinds of frugal engineering methods or jugaad, as we call it in Hindi, are ways of uh, managing uh, the routines of autistic adults as they're far away from their family, um, in order to ensure that they do not have a violent overreaction and they might not hurt another person if their routines are set in this kind of a stone and drawing is used to do that. The institutional leader who devised this method asked me to give it, uh, give it a go as a bonding exercise between me and my brother because she knew that I have an autistic sibling. What she did not know was that Nippon and I had been drawing together for almost a decade. Often on the spur of a moment, he and I would sit together while glaring at the vastness of the playground that was the MS Paint software on my father's laptop. After leading vastly different days and vastly different schools, our gazes would collide at the same surface. He would direct me to draw all the snacks that he wished he could eat, ranging from kimchi flavored Pringles to banana flavored Kit Kat. His taste for global flavors surprised everyone except my parents and I. Gradually, however, he would urge me to draw things that did not entirely exist. Lace potato chips, which had the flavor of a curry that was served at a family friend's house several years ago. How was I supposed to draw that? Sometimes, exasperated with, this, with his imaginative demands, I would whine about my inability to draw those things and push the laptop or notebook away. Knowing all too well that I couldn't say no for much longer, he would persistently persuade me into submission. And that's how my drawing started as a relationship with my brother. The suggestion of the institutional leader to draw Nippon's daily schedule with him did stay with me over the last summer. If we were to draw his daily schedule, would we bond differently? And would he still demand the impossible? And I think he did. On one morning at the end of Nippon's summer vacations last year, I took another invitation to draw back home. Gleefully agreeing to populate his days with certainty, Nippon began reciting all the things that he did every day since our mother woke him up with a lukewarm cup of milky tea. Just as I, I was about to draw Nippon's minivan after the breakfast portion, as you can see here, so have breakfast, which is chai and bread for him. And then I was drawing, drawing go to school as the next step of his daily schedule. He interrupted me and asked me to draw what exists in the middle. I was interrupted by Nippon's demand to make one and a half tablets and a capsule on paper. I knew all too well that Nippon, like many other autistic adults, was involved in a regimen of taking sedatives from a very young age. Even though my parents informed me of their decision to modulate the dosage in, in conversation with his psychiatrist and cardiologist, they hadn't told me about the recent increase in the morning dosage. So I did not know before this interaction with my brother that he was taking morning sedatives as well. He takes sleeping pills, but I did not know he took them before going to school. 
Momentarily ignoring the amount of medication that Nippon was being expected to ingest every day, I followed his instructions to finish drawing the schedule. For a week after this bonding exercise, Nippon would tick mark next to each step after undertaking the said activity. Soon, however, I noticed that Nippon began coloring over the morning medita medication step with a black marker. By having that portion erased or cut out, he believed that he wouldn't have to take those medicines before going to the daycare center every day. So he colored this black. So after saying all of this, I want to suggest what kind of an invitation then is an invitation to draw? To draw is to improvise an image along with others. To draw is to collate things that we desire into fruition. To draw is to record when reality is too overwhelming. To draw is to desire a new reality. So this is my first set of responses to the question based on an ethnographic vignette from 10 years ago when I was asked to make an autism poster. And then one from last year when once again drawing revealed itself as a practice which is necessarily collaborative and a practice where the desire of the ethnographer and the interlocutor become visible. And it's not just that the desire would become visible as a revelatory force that you can write or think about, but it will come to impact your relationships. When my brother told me that he was taking medicines, which became possible through drawing, uh, I, was, I had to negotiate that revelation of desires um, in my own relationship with my parents, which was extremely hard uh, because they felt that they had betrayed me by not telling me the truth about overdosing my brother. Second, and the other two portions are much smaller, so we will be close to the end very soon. Okay, drawing is an invitation to immerse. We are often told as anthropologists that our work is to immerse ourselves. And um, I don't know how successful that can be if we don't have enough anchors. And my suggestion in this response is that drawing allows us to have anchors while we are immersing ourselves into the field. Inner ethnographic exploration of the varied forms of institutional and communal care in the Canadian Arctic, Lisa Stevenson privileges what she calls the imagistic rather than discursive modes of knowing. For Stevenson, an image allows us to hold on to uncertainty without completely resolving it. An imagistic turn towards uncertainty doesn't exactly mean shying away from acknowledging the objective facts of social existence or actual truths. However, it does mean that other modes of inhabiting or living with social facts or possible truths from our field sites become legible to us and our audiences. What mode of witnessing must an ethnographer come to embody for an imagistic mode of knowing to be revealed to her? Can an ethnographic sensibility to a multiplicity of possible truths in the field be sharpened through drawing? This is the question that I explore the answer to in this section. In June 2022, my father, my brother, and I were supposed to visit my brother's daycare center to celebrate his birthday along with his friends. This is a day after I have arrived my, uh, in my home uh, after my first year of my PhD. I had flown back just in time for this yearly affair when my father would gleefully sponsor a lunch for everyone at Nippon School, which was a daycare center, but we call it Nippon Schools. Every year, my mother would resolutely refuse to participate in this occasion, not because she did not love Nippon, but because she loved him too much. She always told me that if she ever actually visited Nippon's daycare center or school, she would stop sending him there. And this is something which a lot of people mentioned to me, a lot of parents mentioned to me that we love our child and we are having to send our child to a horrible daycare center or a horrible residential care institution, horrible in the sense of the services offered there or the utilities that are present there, um, but we must send them somewhere because we can't manage them by ourselves. And a lot of these individuals are on the lower functioning end with higher needs, obviously. Located around 30 kilometers away from our home, Nippon School was one of the most popularly subscribed to rehabilitation centers for cognitively disabled adults in Northern Delhi. This popularity, however, stemmed in part from the lack of other institutions in and around that district. Many families had been sending their children to Nippon schools for almost a decade. So the, the range of people that were present there, especially age-wise, was very wide. So a lot of people were present there, uh, youngsters, uh, adolescents, and even uh, adults uh, at the age of, I think, 40 or 50 were also present in that institution. 
Many families had been sending their children to Nipun school for almost a decade and trying to get their adult children admitted to a newer institution, which might be even farther from their homes and a lot more expensive, wasn't exactly an option. While looking at Nipun calmly looking outside the car window, I was preparing myself to be reacquainted with the institutional window unto his world after almost two years. As we were reaching closer to the center, we were leaving the city, traffic, and concrete roads behind. Nipun was ecstatic. It was, a, it was a rare occasion for his family to accompany him on this path that he traversed in the center's minivan every day. Constantly muttering what he would eat, he would be eating at the center that day to celebrate his birthday with his friends. He would briefly make eye contact with me and turn his cheek towards me asking for a kiss. Just as we were about to park our car near the center, my father told me that he was carrying my Stanford business cards with him and he wanted me to do field work at Nippon school. He wanted me to be a spy at his school so that they know uh, that there's somebody who can actually see what's actually happening inside the institution. A familial visit began turning into a field visit. What I wish to particularly describe here is how an impulse to draw during this familial slash field visit aided me in looking at the rehabilitation center with a gradual gaze, something that I described at the beginning of the talk based on Jasmine Kashanipur's work. Despite that space, this institution having been discursively rendered as potentially injurious, a lot of parents had the assumption that this place has no possibility of care or community, but we must send our child there because there's no other institution here. I'm not suggesting that drawing can redeem the injuries inherent within certain ecologies and arrangements of care. What I am suggesting, however, is that how people come to inhabit the objective fact of precarity, vulnerability, and injury cannot always be anticipated at the first look. And here, look is very important. While I was not exactly drawing in the moment of my encounter with the environment and the people that made up that institution, I was scribbling certain stick figures on the back of my business cards, which I would later refer to while drawing on my iPad. So all the sketches that I make are on my iPad. As I was too busy worrying about Nippon not slipping on the mud right where he had where we had parked, I aimlessly followed him into what seemed to be the basement of the center. I um, Nippon was dangerously close to trampling on another student's bare legs, so I held on to his hand. As I reverted my gaze back upon the student, I found out that his hands were tied behind his back to a metal desk. While he was deep in sleep in his disheveled clothes, his closed eyes seemed to have residual tears around them. Listening to Nippon's voice, I turned my attention towards the staircase that went towards the first floor. Nippon was meticulously trying to take each step one by one on a staircase which had no railing. Right around that staircase, another student was pretending to drive a motorcycle while actually pulling along a children's tricycle, which was quite small for him. He smiled at me and told me that he was going to the nearby market for his motorbike. How could these two sites, uh, S-I-G-H-T-S, intersect at the same site, S-I-T-E? Immediately after these two encounters, I sketched out two stick figures on my business cards, anchors, while going upstairs to the director's office. In later conversations that day and during a subsequent visit, I got to know that both of the students, Nirmay and Anuj, were on the autism spectrum. Nirmay was a resident at the center and he was routinely tied up because he would tear his clothes up during an overstimulation that was pretty much routinized. During mornings, he would obediently follow through his daily tasks, but right after lunch, he would himself ask the caretakers to tie him up, and I saw that firsthand, because he would begin to feel upset and he needed something to, to, hold, to, to hold him together. During my next visit I, I visit, I saw Nirmay running around the basement while Anuj, the person on the bicycle, tricycle, was following him on his motorbike. The knowledge that I was going to draw out some of my encounters during that day made me see the institution and the kind of care it discursively represented in a different light. The gradual gaze of ethnographic drawing, therefore, allows for a moral and political judgment to also be made gradually. What kind of an invitation, then, is an invitation to draw? To draw is to immerse uh, with an eye for anchors. 
To draw is to juxtapose our moral certainties next to the uncertainty of a blank page. To draw is to be open to the seemingly impossible, that there can be a sense of community and care in this space, that when you see somebody being tied up, it's not necessarily a violent uh, mode of uh, engaging with the life of um, this young adult who is living here, but it's something that they need themselves to feel uh, you know, a sense of control in a space far away from home. And I don't think I would have been able to notice that if I did not draw, if I did not have this kind of an anchor that I saw something, I saw an image that moved me, I drew it on my way back and I knew that I had to go back to the field to ask uh, about that person. And that's also what I try to address in my last section, which is drawing is an invitation to be impressed or to impress. So, sorry. Yeah, Polythnographic field work is a genre of living that devotedly embraces the risk of being in the face of another. Its preliminary stages can be the most unsettling precisely because the other remains hauntingly ephemeral. As ethnographers in the making, and here I'm particularly talking to early career uh, graduate students, we are supposed to meander into spaces that might never actually become our field sites and meet people who might never actually become our interlocutors. Yet precisely because of this uncertainty, we feel the urge to be radically open-ended to the affective, corporeal, and moral claims that are inevitably headed our way from unforeseen sources. Wrestling with multiple claims in spaces where we have an uncertain future why must we turn to drawing? I'm just checking the time. Okay. In July 2022, as monsoons were beginning to envelop Delhi, I finally heard back from one of the managers at the oldest assisted living facility for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDDs, in India. Located in Southwest Delhi, the facility was founded, led, and sustained by parents of individuals with IDDs. The manager had taken her time to read through my CV and summer research proposal to get back to me with an appointment. While preparing for my visit, I chose to wear my beloved kurta. Even though I generally did not wear clothes that could signal my queerness in the field, I knew that I needed to feel most at ease for this particular field visit because I knew that there will be too many questions. Nobody had ever asked to read my CV or my summer research proposal. Um, which I already had prepared, of course, uh, but a lot more institutions often asked me to do several calls on WhatsApp before allowing me to visit them. But this particular institution wanted all kinds of documentation before I entered that space. So I knew that they are not working informally um, and they would have a lot of questions before I can have access to um, you know, people there. Unlike most of the residential care institutions that I had visited, there was an actual register at the entry gate, which was supposed to be filled under the supervision of a security guard. Right before me, the gardener and cook had made their way in for duty. I entered the purpose of my visit as interview. Even though vague, I knew interview aptly described what I was about to experience. I was not about to interview the person there, but those the, the, the institutional caregiver was supposed to interview me. Looking at the sprawling campus, I began to feel unsure about the need for an ethnographer's present at such a well-managed institution. Especially against a gray sky, the building's hopeful colors seemed almost too reassuring. As I made my way through the reception to meet my point of contact, I could barely hear anything but the loudness of the ceiling fans. Everyone was wearing masks, so I swiftly put, on, put mine on again, which I had removed while entering the institution while talking to the security guard. As soon as we, uh, I walked up to the manager's desk and introduced myself before taking a seat, as soon as we exchanged a business card, she asked me what exactly an anthropologist's job was. The most difficult question, which I'm still figuring out an answer to. I rummaged together a response using phrases like deep hanging out, uh, cultural understandings, uh, listening carefully, uh, writing accessibly. As she kept her questions going, I couldn't hear her clearly because we were both wearing masks and we were sitting right under a very strong fan. Suddenly, a long-standing worry about experiencing hearing loss, which runs in my family, resurfaced in my mind. Feeling too ashamed to ask her to speak more loudly, I tried my best to respond to whatever it was that she wanted to know about my background. As she began to stand up to show me the center, I sprang up enthusiastically. It was during this walkthrough that I met Puneet. I caught a glimpse of Puneet when the manager had asked me to go see the male dormitory on the top floor. 
In his late 40s, Puneet seemed to be interested in talking to someone. He greeted me with an impatient look and then directed his gaze towards his caretaker. The caretaker greeted me and told me that it was time for Puneet's kitchen duty. As I tried to follow Puneet, the manager asked me how I liked their beds compared to those of other centers, which is another aspect of institutional ethnography. If you do more than one institutional uh, as your research sites, you're constantly asked to compare and uh, give, you know, participate in communities of gossip. I had barely noticed the beds. Just as I was articulating a response, another caretaker asked us to come to the kitchen as the lunch was ready. They just wanted to show me what they had cooked, not serve me the food. Puneet was drying off the steel utensils with a rag cloth. As soon as we entered, he directly addressed the manager as ma'am and asked her when his sisters were going to come to visit him. The manager told him that I had come from the US and I could answer whatever questions he had. I could feel my eyes widen. The manager sat on the dining table to judge whether I was indeed capable of being uh, an attended anthropologist. And that was the test that I was thrown into. Pushed into a space where I had to respond to Puneet's claims, I looked at him and introduced myself as somebody who would love to talk to him. Without hesitating, he just asked me what he should do when he would, he, he would miss his home terribly. I remembered my conversations with the manager about how skillfully the caretakers tried to manage the emotions of the residents by asking them to think of the institution as their only home. I responded by being honest about missing my home too when I was in the US. He asked me what I did to deal with that. I said that I intently looked at my family photographs and tried to imagine as if my family was right next to me. I assume, assured him that physical distance did not mean that her sisters did not miss him or care for him. After hearing that, Puneet's, eye, Puneet's eyes lit up and he looked into my eyes and asked, would you please bless me with your hands? Even though I had almost forgotten about the difference in our age, I knew that I couldn't possibly bless someone so much older than me. I held Puneet's hands and asked him to bless me. When he placed his hands upon my head, they felt heavier than they looked. The weight was perhaps moral in nature. After coming back home, inspired from Letizia Bonanno's style of ethnographic drawings, I drew myself into the encounter with Puneet in order to anchor my body as a primary site of exploration in fieldwork, which is a genre of drawing that Bonanno is extremely famous for. And this is a genre of drawing that where you include the ethnographer in the drawing encounter. And this is almost close to uh, a very interesting method called body mapping, where you actually uh, map the areas of your bodies that have been touched or have been claimed upon. Um, and this really helped me to actually remember what had happened that day. Um, because if you actually go through one of the earliest visits to some uh, institutions that are very, very uh, closely guarding uh, themselves, or any field site for that matter. There are so many encounters, there are so many people, there are so many sites that it's very easy for you to forget what actually happened. But when you actually think of um, what happened and draw it out, especially by treating your body as, Bona as Bonanno calls it, as a site of primary, as a primary site of exploration, I think you can actually see the sites of impression on your body that the field leaves. Drawing this particular encounter allowed me to ascertain the multiple claims that were made upon me during that singular field visit. If I hadn't drawn, I wouldn't have remembered that I was wearing a mask, and I wouldn't have remembered that I was experiencing worries about hearing loss in the field, and I wouldn't have thought about why I was feeling so ashamed to talk about it in a place that claimed to be uh, you know, disability, um, re a disability rehabilitation center. So finally, what kind of an invitation, sorry, Sorry, there's one last slide. What kind of an invitation then is an invitation to draw? To draw is to trace the impression that an ethnographer's present, presence is bound to leave in the field. To draw is to trace the impression that a field is supposed to leave in the body of the ethnographer. To draw is to recollect the residues of relations. To draw is to be compelled to return. With that, thank you so much for being such patient listeners. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Paris. That was amazing. Um, so I have enabled uh, the chat for the uh, 
the audience members, the participants. So in case you have any questions for Paris, now's the time. Please do um, type in your questions. You can either send them to me directly um, if you want to be anonymous or you can just address it to everybody. So um, I guess as everyone's gathering their thoughts, maybe I can I can just like start off with um, the um, the journey that you take us through, Paras, is also particularly amazing because, yes, of course, the attempt here is to talk about the method and the reflections and how is it that ethnography, the paths that ethnography can take in a very sensitive um, field, right? And the sensitivity is not just with respect to, you know, controversies as to, you know, dealing with people with certain disabilities, with certain care duties, but also the human emotional aspect of it. That's also where um, the, these sites become very sensitive. So I guess my first question to you was that you've spoken very eloquently and very extensively on, of course, uh, the mark that the ethnographer, you know, leaves. And as you know, anybody with an, uh, who's immersed in anthropological um, study would know that, okay, the, the anthropologist and the ethnographer definitely leaves a presence in the field. And you also ended with the definitely acknowledging that the, the physical uh, marks of the field also on, on the ethnographer. But uh, I guess um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about when you were immersed in situations that were really on the spur of the moment, right? Whether it be, you know, going to your brother's school and then, you know, playing the double spy or even let's say in the last case where you were called upon in, you know, in, in your many identities as an ethnographer, as a human being, as a, as a person emotionally able to connect and uh, with, with the person at hand, what does it do to the emotional body of the ethnographer as well? And if you could speak a little bit about, uh, you've spoken on what you did, but how is it that ethnographers or anthropologists faced with certain decisions in these settings um, should be able to, or what is the thought process they should, they should perhaps walk themselves through while making decisions like these in the spur of the moment when put in such positions in the field? Thank you. Thank you. And we have a lot of questions. So I'll actually start responding to yours and then respond to the questions in the chat box. Um, thank you for that um, lovely comment uh, and question. Um, I think one of the things that I had to be attentive towards was um, treat my body, especially in the third response, as already connected to another body, uh, which was in the field. Um, but the issue then is that, especially when you do preliminary ethnographic research, when you don't know who your prime interlocutors are, it's very hard to know those spaces and those moments of relatedness where something is revealed about uh, how autism, as I said, is a shared condition, um, precisely because of the amount of care that lower functioning individuals uh, demand um, in, in the context of India, where, you know, diagnostic and rehabilitative support has been particularly difficult to catch hold of. Um, I think drawing becomes useful in that moment to just take a note of what happened. Uh, I think just knowing that you might have to, we, we all know that we're going to go back home and write, right? We know that. And what I'm trying to suggest is, and this might actually also respond to, uh, I think, Priyanka's uh, question. Um, when you also know that you're going to go back home and draw, and that drawing doesn't necessarily have to be artistically skillful. You draw the map of the place. You draw a chart of all the terms that might have come up during field work. You draw even a stick figure as your body and actually mark the places that were touched. Uh, you put down colors that were used to paint the building, especially in opposition to a gray sky. Once you know that you have to do that labor, once you go back home, you begin to see things differently. And I think that is what I'm trying to suggest, that just knowing that you're going to write it out makes you write something completely different. It is, and that's what's very difficult because once you see this talk, it seems like this was how it was supposed to be. This is exactly what happened in the field, but it wouldn't have happened. And I wouldn't have said all of this. These moments might not have actually stood out 
precisely because um, I was not thinking like, um, I don't want to say an artist, but thinking like a, a person who draws in that moment, right? That there are, I'm, I'm trying to hold off these anchors, uh, which must be drawn for me to feel um, comfortable uh, and also feel like I, I put it down on paper, what happened. Um, so that's one. I think that also helps with emotionally managing uh, the and reflecting on what has happened during the field during the field work. Um, and this idea of being called upon by the other, it's it's a very fascinating idea, which I'm really moved by this because Levinas is my favorite philosopher. But as I said in my presentation, the other is not always clear who that other is in the field. And I'm not saying the drawing will help you see who exactly that person is but you will come to see how shared your life is with that other if you draw relationships you draw moments you draw maps you draw you you put down colors that 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 remind you of that particular day and i do that um and i might have actually i should have shown the, those things more but uh yeah i'm actually going to read and respond to questions in in the chat if that's okay um so i think i've addressed priyanka's question um that it is a different kind of sensibility uh, if you would remember that you actually have to draw. Uh, I hate taking field notes because I don't like writing, um, but I've trained myself to do that. And my argument is that why can't we train students to also draw and do other forms of expressive genres that they have been trained into before they became anthropologists. Before I was an anthropologist, I was uh, somebody who was not in a very well-funded school in India. Um, and I did not know English that well. So I did not use language as much as I used drawing uh, or images to speak. And I've tried to bring that skill to anthropology and that has kind of helped me to write better if that's the end goal of all anthropologists. Uh, the name of the author whose book, so that's a piece by Jasmine Kashani Pur. It's, in, it's called The Gradual Gaze. Uh, it's in Anthropology and Humanism, it's an article. Uh, so you can look that up. Uh, Isabel's question is something that I've also asked very often, and I think I should have a slide on that. So the two most popular books are Andrew Cossey's book, um, uh, Ethnographic Drawing, on Ethnographic Drawing, and then there's Michael Tostick's book that I talked about, I Swear I Saw This. So those are two of the most uh, like hailed books, but I think a lot more work has been done by anthropologists uh, of color, anthropologists, uh, women anthropologists, and queer anthropologists. Letizia Lubano's work, for uh, Bonanno's work, for example, as I talked about, um, I think she has an article called, uh, It Traumatized Me, So I Drew It, which was an interesting take on, I swear I saw this, and how certain, certain ethnographic bodies are much more legible to be claimed upon by compared to other bodies. And how in order to testify to those claims, we might need different genres of expression. And I think that point that Bonanno makes about uh, the fact that the ethnographer's body is always gendered, always racialized, and that requires different forms of representations is important. So Letizia Bonanno's work is there, Jasmine Koshani Pur is there, Carolyn, Carol Hendrickson's work is also really interesting. Anthropology and Humanism has a whole series uh, of ethnographic drawing that might be a good place to start. Um, I might have forgotten everything that you shared. Is there a way to read this? I kept a screenshot of the page which had the difficult sentence really. I'm hoping to publish some of this. So I'm going to share it for sure. Uh, if you could drop me an email, uh, I'm more than willing to share it uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, it's just to suggest you the book, Maria and Me. Yes, I've heard of it and I really want to get to it. Thank you so much, um, Karina. Um, thank you so much. Uh, have you had an opportunity to explore drawing as a way to recall memories, as a way to capture events that are more immediate? Um, yes, I try to draw even when it's not a field encounter and I'm not able to do it as much because I have so much coursework to do, but not anymore. Uh, so I'm going to do it more often. And um, I actually like going to drawings from my childhood as a way of thinking as to what are some kind of similarities in the ways I have taken up certain things. So my, my first project in autism was on motherhood and care, and it seemed very similar to the kind of argument that I was making in that work. It was almost, um, 
you know, it was like a prophecy, the, the poster that I made in 2012 uh, about the, the way I represented autism. Um, and I think images have the capacity to be prophetic, which words often kind of fail. So I think having a constant record of how you're feeling um, in relationship to other people is actually much more helpful for future work that you will do. Um, manage the ethics of spying and reporting the worlds of your with whom it might not always be easy to discuss. Yeah, it's it's always difficult. Thank you, Aaron, for that question. It's always difficult to procure consent in traditional ways because uh, who the ideal ethnographic interlocutor is is always very limited, I would say. Um, I always anonymize, I always seek permission from institutional caregivers, if not necessarily the autistic adults themselves, because a lot of them are nonverbal, but I actually often show them the drawings that I make of them, and that becomes a way of kind of engaging with them further. I'm still developing the method of drawing with my interlocutors, um, so that will take some time, but yeah, I'm, I'm developing ways of seeking consent, which are not necessarily for an institutional acknowledgement, but for my own kind of personal um, kind of embedding in the field. Um, I might not be able to answer all of them, but I'm just reading through them. Uh, I was wondering if you had explored capturing the notion of value through the drawing medium, w whether the value of the events or imagined space are transferred to the drawing. Does the drawing speak the same level of value in reimagined drawing? That's actually a wonderful question, Devika. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to think more about that. I don't want to half as a response to that. Um, thank you so much uh, for sharing this, uh, Karina, uh, this resource. Um, thank you, Shrishta, for that comment. Um, I'm going to, of course, respond to everyone <laughs> at length further. Um, thank you so much, Veronica. different kind of grammar. Yes, if drawing is, as you beautifully suggest, a different kind of grammar, forging different kinds of sensibilities and relationships, what would a training for anthropologists in this mode look like? Yeah, that's, I think, <laughs> the thing that I'm most struggling with because I deal with a lot of um, supervisors, not, not supervisors, a lot of professors in different places who are very interested in this. So I presented a paper along similar lines at Chicago Ethnography Conference that was primarily uh, with sociologists. And a lot of the questions were that we don't actually deal with visual stuff. So I don't know if this is a useful method for me. And I said, well, you make pie charts, you make graphs. They are also a visual representation of what you just experienced. Everyone doesn't need to take up drawing in similar ways. Um, it could be taken in ways more than one. Um, and I think it should be included then, for example, let's say in the history of anthropology courses that we do uh, in our departments to actually show how um, since the colonial inception of our discipline, various methods have been employed by anthropologists to attend to the worlds that they were um, studying and even capturing. Um, and that's why there's a lot of skepticism of something like photography, for example, that it's necessarily violent because it captures, it freezes the subject in opposition to drawing that remakes the subject. I don't necessarily agree to that, um, but I think it's important to actually have conversations like that as part of mainstream anthropology courses. So to not read Susan Sontag in a course on photography, but to read her in history of anthropology, to read a uh, work on drawing in anthropology and not in visual anthropology is really important because there's a hierarchy of, of, of sub-disciplines, right? We're all supposed to know the, the, the main text for political anthropology, but not necessarily for visual. And I think that kind of hierarchy leads to a division of knowledge production, which is not helpful for anyone. Um, thank you so much, Shreya, for your comment. Uh, exhibit works and how you get permissions to. I don't exhibit works. Um, and um, I have all the institutions that I kind of talked about today know that I've drawn uh, these things uh, for them, but I don't represent, like I've never exhibited my ethnographic drawings. When I will publish, uh, I will definitely seek uh, their guidance as to the extent to uh, which I can actually go and talk about those spaces. I would maybe perhaps not mention the districts that they are in. I will always use a pseudonym for them, even though they are comfortable with having their names on. Um, I think it, it sometimes anonymity helps with certain kinds of claims about institutional life. 
Um, uh, thank you, Valeria, uh, for that lovely comment. And um, I'll try to do an exhibit. I'll put my email down here for anybody who might be interested in reaching out to me. Um, and yeah, this was lovely. Uh, I'm, I know we are over the time, but I think we can take maybe one or two more questions if uh, we're okay. Sure. Um, if there there are there is anyone who'd like to put questions in the chat, perhaps you can take one or two more. <laughs> but meanwhile, um, I would really like to thank everybody who joined us today. And uh, in case I mean uh, you would like to not stay on for the talk, that's okay. But we can also stick around for a few more minutes um, and definitely ask Paris uh, more about their work. And uh, so thank you so much for everybody who has joined us from all parts of the world across all time zones uh, to be here. And a big thank you, of course, to uh, Paris uh, to be able to present this amazing work. Clearly, that has impacted and is found interesting by so many people, as, as has been shown with a variety of questions and the people who very diligently attended uh, uh, today. And uh, a special thank you also to the Stanford Center for South Asia, who has always enabled us to be able to present the work from different speakers like Paris um, and uh, create just a safe space uh, to be able to do that. So thank you especially to Lalita and Simrat uh, from the Center of South Asia for allowing us to be able to do, to do this work. Um, if there are any more questions, uh, I'm just looking through the chat. Maybe just a big round of applause for Paris. <laughs> Um, there was a question by Monica about how to be in touch with future events. Uh, uh, did we put something about South Asia Working Group? So you can find us on the Stanford Center for South Asia webpage. We'll send, we'll put a link here. Uh, we won't be the co-coordinators next year, but we are sure excellent people are going to take up, um, you know, uh, this job. And you can actually look up our past talks. Uh, they have been archived on YouTube. So we have... Uh, uh, recordings of earlier talks by speakers on YouTube. Um, I think Shubhangani is just looking for the link that we can post in. Meanwhile, uh, uh, Ulysses' question about um, legibility impacts uh, representation. Yeah, I think that has been one of my struggles, especially in field sites which have been... Um, very crowded, very um, very unkempt. Um, and I think there's a wonderful piece by, uh, I think if I'm not wrong, it is by uh, Jasmine Kashanipur, I think uh, it's called Drawing in the Dark. Um, it's also an anthropology and humanism. Um, and I think she suggests that uh, modes of drawing during, during um, moments of illegibility, uh, or we could even take that illegibility as a kind of crisis, as a moral kind of crisis, where we don't know who the victim is and who the oppressor is, leads to certain forms of eruption in um, our, it leads to certain forms of eruptions, which I think can be better captured with something beyond words. I'm thinking of the work uh, by Didi Uberman on the survival of the fireflies and how that particularly, that book especially helped me to think about um, the, the dispelling or the disappearance of certain forms of life um, as signs and as, as opportunities for further engagement with the genre of uh, writing or genre of um, of uh, representation. Um, so I take illegibility as an invitation itself for further uh, engagement with um, what uh, was taken as granted as the given genre of representation, right? What exactly was allowed as uh, legitimate knowledge um, and how that's challenged by moments of crisis, moments of illegibility. And I think then we have to think about illegibility and legitimacy and what relationship they do these two things have. 
sorry for going completely <laughs> abstract during this moment, but I have a few interesting references that might be helpful. I think Drawing in the Dark is a good, uh, a good article to look up. And I think D.D. Uberman's, uh, which I'm sure, you know, you must have uh, come across, Survival of the Fireflies. I think that's a wonderful book to think with about illegibility. And that is a condition for further ethnographic work. Thank you. I think we are okay. wonderful. I think maybe we should uh, draw the event to a close now. Uh, thank you everyone again, and I hope to see you in our future events. I have shared the link to our uh, Stanford South Asia Working Group webpage where you can stay updated on our events. You can also sign up for a mailing list from there. And of course, we also update all of our events on the Stanford, uh, sorry, the South Asia Working Group Instagram page, the handle for which I've also put in the chat. Uh, and with that, uh, lovely people, have a lovely rest of your day or the evening, and hopefully we'll catch you at the next event. Bye.